Welcome to Chautauqua People. I'm John V. My guest today is Jane Conroe. She serves as Vice Chairman of the Chautauqua Conowango Consortium. She's a native of the Cleveland, Ohio area, graduated from Kent State with a degree in chemistry and a minor in education. She came to the Chautauqua region when her husband accepted a position as Executive Director of the Chautauqua Lake Association. She taught school, raised her family, returned to teaching for decades at Maple Grove and Bemis until retiring in 2012. In retirement, she's done everything for local waters and is currently involved with the Chautauqua Lake Association where she takes water samples. Jane, how did you become interested in the status of Lake Chautauqua? It doesn't take long to kind of fall in love with this place. It, uh, I obviously was not a native to Chautauqua County, but uh, having moved here with young children, uh, I skated on the lake every winter, um, rode snowmobiles, sled riding, and then of course in the summer, swimming, boating, anything that had to do with just being outside. And the children loved it, and I, it didn't take long for me to just kind of like being around wa the water more. I have to say Lake Erie, of course, was my lake, my big lake, I call it. But the fact that Chautauqua Lake kind of um, started to look like it was maybe in need of a few additional things was not long after we got involved with the Lake Association. Uh, my husband had obviously been very involved, but they needed some volunteers to take water samples mm -hmm. in Chautauqua Lake. And in 1987, we said, well, sure, we're right here, it's convenient, we can go get them, let's go do this. And we did, and we've been doing it every summer since. Uh, 16 times a summer, we go out on the lake and take water samples that are then analyzed. And it tells us how she's doing, you know, yeah. whether or not she's okay or not. Now, how do you draw the samples? The samples are taken um, from a boat. We need to be out in the deepest section. So a sample is taken in the South Basin uh, by a wonderful volunteer, Jeff Moore. And then our sample that we actually take is in the North Basin, but we have to be in the deepest part of the basin, as close as we can get. So we go out in the boat and it's a, a large bottle. It looks like a big bottle and it's got open top and bottom. And above that is a large weight. So we open the bottle, put it in the water, drop the weight, the bottle closes. Catches that sample, however deep we're supposed to take it, and we transfer it to another bottle, take it to shore. So you, you have depth considerations also. Absolutely. Typically how deep do you normally go when you're drawing samples? So in the North Basin, we need to take two samples, one at 10 meters deep or about 30 feet, and then one at 1.5 meters. So very close to the surface and down deep. That's, yes. And the lake isn't much deeper than that, is it? It's not a real deep lake. No, um, the place that we take our samples there is about 33 to 35 feet deep. There are holes, there are some kettle holes that are deeper, but they're difficult to find, to pinpoint that spot. Mm -hmm. And this deeper, general deeper area is easy to find. Mm -hmm. Who does the lab work? The lab work is done by a, a laboratory in Syracuse, they uh, are a, what is called a state certified lab, so the samples are then packaged up in smaller bottles. We do a little bit of filtering before they go, uh, freeze them, and ship them out. And then the lab, the state certified lab in Syracuse, mm -hmm. analyzes them. What do, what do they look for? What do they measure? They are measuring um, several things. They, they, we've, over the years, the, the parameters have changed, but mostly pH, um, the two nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen in various forms. Then we go to chlorides. Uh, we have checked for in the deep waters for arsenic. Um, and once in a while, algal samples are also taken. So we do a chlorophyll sample also. And that tells us how much living material is in that water. Mm -hmm. and, and just to repeat, how many times a season then are you? So we take eight samples in the North Basin, eight samples in the South Basin every summer. Every summer? Every summer. And that would go, let's say, from June onward? Just about, yes. We start usually around the first of June and then go through at least into September. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and are these are the results of this testing posted somewhere? Um, they are. Uh, the Chautauqua Lake Association is involved with a state organization called NICE FOLA, New York State's Federation of Lake Associations. They, with the DEC, 
on their websites will post that information. Nice Fola is most responsible for posting the information publicly. So one could go and look look up the results of your Absolutely. work. Absolutely. How long does it normally take from the sampling process to the results being posted? We can now, with a little bit of uh, better computer work, uh, post them almost immediately, a few of the results, mm -hmm. um, things that we can really get from the boat that we know right when we're there. Um, the actual lab work takes some time, so it is months, um, quite often into the winter and spring of the following year before we have some scientific results from the lab. That's yeah. serious business then, isn't it? It is, it is, it's important. Yeah, let's switch gears a little bit. And there are two well-known associations concerned with lake quality, Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy and the Chautauqua Lake Association. Could you tell me what the focus is of each and and a little what they're, more what they're up to? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll start with the Lake Association. Uh, my association with them obviously has been as a volunteer taking these water samples. The, the part of that came from Doug, my husband's work, because the Lake Association was his kind of his first job here in the area, of course, as you said, and then and now his current job. The Lake Association is responsible for what we have always called the in-lake maintenance. It is the harvesters that you see out on the lake. They look like big combines, big lawnmowers, and those are the harvesters that the Lake Association runs. That's their main focus, but they obviously also have been worried about, concerned about the the health of the lake when it comes to these, this water sampling program. Invasive species, they have a boat steward program, which means any boats coming in or going out of the lakes in Chautauqua County, not just Chautauqua Lake, are monitored for invasive species. Wonderful program that they started. Um, and they've always had Bob Johnson, who was part of Racine Johnson Ecologists, doing plant surveys, plant um, and herbivore surveys, in other words, how the plants are doing and how the insects are doing that eat, eat the plants. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the work, both scientific and in lake maintenance that the CLA does. The Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy, uh, I served on its board for a while and also as a volunteer, plus a little bit of conservation work for them. They are concerned mostly about the watersheds of Chautauqua County not just the lake again, but the watersheds of Chautauqua County. So they're wor worried and concerned about what happens on the land as it drains to the body of water. So land conservation, um, again, education uh, for, for all of our organizations is a big piece of what we do. And they have, they have proven to us that they have uh, some of the answers. There's, there's an awful lot that can be learned from the watershed and how it affects the water. And they're involved in land acquisition also? Correct, correct. Both, both from, uh, well, private or, or anyone who has a piece of property that they feel they would like to have preserved, kept as they have always used it as forest lands or water protection areas, um, contact the Chautauqua Watershed Conservancy. They are the ones who either through easements or for outright purchase have protected um, thousands of acres in this county. And so the thought is that that keeps bad stuff from getting into the land. Correct, correct. Okay. Now what's the focus of the Chautauqua Conewango Consortium? Well, sounds like there's one more player on the on the team and, and it is. The, the consortium has is fairly new. Uh, we have been in existence since April of 2020. And it turned out that both of those organizations, the CLA and the CWC, have uh, boards of directors and members. Mm -hmm. And both of those boards would be expected to be protectors of the water, protectors of the land. And I, I couldn't say more about how both of those organizations have done that job. However, they have boards and memberships that may not want them to say some of the things that once in a while need to be said, or questions that need to be asked, mm -hmm. or, or corrections, if I would, could, to say that science is okay, but there's better science. Right. And, and th that in itself is a very um, uh, controversial thing to say. 
because mm -hmm. you say whose science is better is a very difficult question to answer. So right. w we're not going to make any, any claims that somebody's science is better. But what we do want to make sure is what is being explained to the public has the best information that any of us can find right now. Science is famous for changing its mind. The earth was as flat as this table for a long time. I thought the, it still is. Uh, the scientists changed their minds a few years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and our minds. And, and there's many. There are, that's one of the simplest examples to give. Right. And that's what the beauty of science is. We keep learning more. And as we learn more, we can contribute more. The consortium has attempted to now keep the voice of protection of the waters at the forefront of what we do. We um, are n not based in money on local funding other than a membership contribution from those that want to join. We have had incredibly generous donors who have kept this organization s from the beginning and now I can see th through to the future. Without um, the responsibility of going out and doing fundraising mm -hmm. and constantly attempting to get money to run the organization. We are all volunteers because we are part of the Waterkeeper um, initiative and the Waterkeeper program. It's called the Waterkeeper Alliance. We are an affiliate, so we are all um, volunteers. Mm -hmm. we, we pretty much a shoestring budget would keep us still going. We can right. still put out advertisements, we can still put out articles, we can our website has an incredible amount of information that people can go to. Mm -hmm. What are your primary expenses other than the publicity? Um, we've, we've bought a few um, tchotchke for the people to pick up and have. We want them to know about us. Right. Caps, posters, um, some of the advertising that we do is done just through having some banners put up on a table and, and now we can see them. We can see what's, what's happening out there. Um, pretty well done and, and hopefully easy easy for everyone to see. A um, little bit of money for that same water monitoring that the CLA is doing it doesn't come free when you use good laboratory work. Mm -hmm. We are, one of our charter requirements from being a water keeper is to monitor the watershed. I just want to mention real quickly, the watershed for our consortium is not just Chautauqua Lake. Right. There, we have a map of that, do we Ah, know? yes. If you could take a look at that map, it shows a, a shape that's not Chautauqua Lake. The kind of the outline and profile of Chautauqua Lake is familiar. Right. This rather, almost just a very simple shape is the Kanawango Creek watershed. Okay. Chautauqua Lake, Bear Lake, and the Cassadaka Lakes are the lakes that are in this watershed, along with the Shadowcoin River, the Casadega and the Kanawango. Okay, so they all drain together into Lake Chautauqua. Uh, into the Kanawango Creek. Kanawango Creek. That takes it all to the Allegheny River. Okay. So this is a sub-watershed of the Allegheny River. Got it, got yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, and so that that is is the area of the interest of the organization is defined by the definition of the watershed. By that watershed. Got it. So we're responsible really for monitoring the waters throughout the watershed and that that does take some finances because of the lab work that's required. Right, right. And can you tell us a few, there are, I know this, I'm looking at the banners here and um, there's a some items that sort of tell what the what the watershed consortium or your, the uh, water consortium does and being science-based and and the like. Yep, yep. Science-based. Uh, we want to we want to advocate. We want to be the protector. Right. We we need to speak up every once in a while. Right. And sometimes that's a difficult thing to do because once in a while what we have to say is not the popular opinion. It may not be the thing that everybody really wants to hear because it's not the easiest thing. Right. But we know, again, from all of that science background that there are things that the watershed needs, but that water body needs. It's a, it's a living body. Right. Every lake, every creek has got an entire world called an ecosystem that needs to live. And right. so it, 
we speak for the fish. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a wonderful lady said, well, what language do those fish speak? What signs can they read? <laughs> so we need to interpret for them. <laughs> right, right. Now, um, you use the term water keeper. Where did that, come, where did that term originate? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I need to look up my history of the Water Keeper Alliance, but it turns out that water keeper means that that person realizes and wants to be responsible for that water, mm -hmm. will keep and protect that water. I firmly believe that there are Native Americans everywhere, historically and now, that are water keepers. Mm -hmm. They, out of so many of our heritage and people before us, understand how important the water is. I think water keeper means those people. Mm -hmm. In this organization, water keeper means the person who is responsible for that geographical area. Now, Melanie Smith is the chair of our consortium. Mm -hmm. She can't have the official title water keeper because we are not a paid organization. We are not a paid water keeper. We are an affiliate. Mm -hmm. So, but she is the face of that of our organization because of that. And so, if you look on the website, you'll you'll see that there is always a person, and it's a singular person. Every water keeper across the world has a water keeper in that position. It's a person, right? Who now understands what their geographical area is and what it's responsible right. for. Now, do you have some people with scientific background? You're a, you're a chemist by training. I am a chemist by training. Our board of advisors turns out to be our, our, our workhorse. Uh, we do have members who have generously given. Our board of advisors then are a group of individuals that have an incredible amount of scientific background from rocket science to medicine to biology, physics, we have a score of people, and uh, again, I encourage everyone to go to our website and really look at those biographies of our, of our advisors. Um, a newly, very soon, um, PhD for the bat experts of the world who, um, I, I know you know a few of them, but there's a young man who has been studying the bats up in, all over the county and decided that GIS was going to be a little bit of geography and a little bit of tracking information was going to be what he concentrates on. Mm -hmm. His love is with those, those living creatures. So, and a, a few others who, well, I can't, I have to mention the spiny soft shell turtle. Right. You can't miss it if, if we see where in this logo lives a spiny soft shell turtle. Can we see that on the camera? Can you see the spiny soft shell? He's our logo. She's our logo. Okay. The best place in the state of New York to visit the endangered spiny softshell turtle is in the Shattacoin River. Really? The outlet. One of our board members is currently working very, very hard with the Watershed Conservancy to make sure that the Shattacoin has not only a viable water body, but makes a home for these turtles. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of thing that gets us to remember. Who are we keeping the water for? Who uses this water? Why is it here? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's truly, it's not just for us humans. There's a lot of, a, a myriad of things that are living out there that need that water. Right, and um, we sort of thought of the fish and muscalange and other things. Oh, but, you bet. But it's really, it's a much wider variety of fish, is it not? Very much so. Um, the numbers I would have to catch, um, but again, the number of species of plants that are in our, in our lakes, the number of species of fish in our lakes, the muscalunge is probably the one that's gonna struggle. Um, really? It, it is. I, I think that there is, there would be a group of fishermen out there, I think if they're listening, that would say, Jane, you gotta say something about the muskies. Their, their habitats have been, have been dwindling. What happened? We're, we can't be positive. There's always that, that amount of doubt, that scientific evidence that we have to have that yeah. says. But if plants aren't there, if there's not a, what's called a weed line for the fishermen, every fisherman that knows there's salt is going to go and look for the weed line. In deep water, 
Sometimes the fish do go to deep water when it's hot outside and the water is cold there. But for much, much of the year, the shallower waters where they can have their babies, raise their babies, and live is where the plants are. And those plants grow in the more shallow areas. If those plants aren't there, their, their habitat is gone. So if plants are reduced, the fish will be reduced. Some people said that um, a few years ago when we, had, when we had some herbicide treatments that took out quite a few of the plants in the South Basin, that the fishing was better than ever. And we, we smiled and wondered, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that if there's fewer plants, there would be more fish. The fishermen, I believe, may have something to this when they said, because the fish went where there were a few plants. So the fishing was better. So they were in concentrated a smaller in, in a smaller area. area. Um, you'd want to you'd want to interview one of those professional fishermen to make sure that that idea is is could really be verified by what they've seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a fellow who runs fishing charters on the program last ah, year, so we'll have to bring him back, back and, and, and talk about yeah, that. Yes. Now, how does the consortium complement these two long-established organizations, as you mentioned? I think that they, both of them can feel free to call us, to contact us, and by the way, that's happened probably hundreds of times already since we started, by talking back and forth and saying, if, if we sign this letter, do you want to sign it with us? If we put out this statement, would you like to sign it with us? That kind of, of communication, that way of saying, we'll say these words, they'll come out in our name, you can support us. Sometimes those organizations, basing their finances on donations, basing their finances on foundation dollars that give their dollars, and basing their, found, their, their, their financial background on, on government dollars, once in a while have to be careful. You can imagine that if funding sources are listening, they may not want to say that. The consortium can, and we have. We feel that we can speak up when need be, and we're really not tied to the finances. So that's a, that's a critical issue, isn't it? It is. It, it truly is. Now, how has the lake's health, this is a, a recognized as a broad question, how has the lake's health changed in the last decade or so? And you have a long perspective here. I do. Um, and. Again, we probably should, you know, drag out, you know, the graphs. You know, we should see that, you know, the so phosphorus and nitrogen are the two main nutrients that fuel the plant growth in a body of water. No question about that. One of those plants is algae. Now they're not considered a plant, they are a separate kind of thing, much smaller in size, microscopic many times, and there's also the cyanobacteria. They're called blue-green algae. Just because sometimes when they're overabundant, the water looks bluish. Mm -hmm. we don't, no one wants to be near that. So why? Why would we have lots of algal growth, lots of plant growth, lots of nutrients? Um, Chautauqua Lake is a lake rich in nutrients. Many of the streams are too. So if we have nutrients, plants are going to grow. What's happened to the nutrients over the last 10 years? Phosphorus has increased. The trend is, and, and, and with my hands I could say, well, you know, this is how it was at the beginning. It's not like this. It's not skyrocketed. But it has gradually increased, increased, increased. We've worked hard. We've tried to prevent some of the nutrients from coming in from the watershed. We've, we've tried hard to say, stop fertilizing your lawns. So many of the messages that the Watershed Conservancy have put out are the right messages to try to reduce those nutrients. I've heard them say, get to the root causes of the problems. That's part of it. Why does the phosphorus keep going up? I wish I had that little magic answer that said, well, there's too many people, there's too many, there's too many, there's too many, there's too much. What's the exact source? There's multiple sources. So there's also, in my eyes, multiple solutions. 
as I worked for the Conservancy much earlier, I said, let's plant some buffers around the edge of the lake. Let's make sure that the edge of the lake is buffered. Some states have mandated that the width of the shoreline has to be vegetated. I'm going to say a bad word. Not lawns. Mowed lawns on a lake are not really good for the lake. Mm -hmm. The buffers are much better. One buffer, two buffers, three buffers. Lots of people have to be willing to put in those buffers to make a big difference. The phosphorus has increased. Nitrogen, yep. We also now know that that algal bloom that happens mm -hmm. needs phosphorus to grow, needs nitrogen to become toxic. That's the one we don't want. Right. And so how has it changed? Have we seen more algal blooms? Some people would say no. I wasn't here in 1937 when the very first treatments for algae were done on this lake mm -hmm. that we know of, that were recorded. Mm -hmm. Dumped chemicals off the back of the paddle wheelers, copper sulfate, dumped it into the lake, bag after bag after bag. Did a great job. Did a great job. Killed the green algae like crazy. Everybody excited. The DEC decided, well, before we get too crazy, let's go and just check this. So for two years after those treatments, the DEC went out with the most extensive scientific analysis of this Chautauqua Lake ever. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful book, and it's just simply titled, you know, Analogy of Chautauqua Lake, you know, 1937. Mm -hmm. Plant studies, water studies, everything you can imagine to tell us what the lake is doing. Yeah. The green algae had decreased. The blue-green algae increased by 300% or more. Whoa. Whoa. So, so we thought we were fixing it. And that's the kind of stuff that every once in a while we need to have that, that greater information, more information that says, how do, we, how do we fix this? So have we had more algal blooms in the last 10 years? I don't know how they compared to that drastic action that was taken back in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. We'd have to go back and really see if there's any photographic evidence that we could, and, mm -hmm. and much more. Mm -hmm. but, but right now, we, we seem to think we're getting more. Mm -hmm. Climate change is, is, is again a, a factor. When the water warms, algal blooms are going to occur. As the temperature of the lake gone up? It has. It Sub definitely has. Substantially or? The warmest temperature in Chautauqua Lake was measured in the South Basin last summer. Warmest ever. Yeah. Yeah. And the South Basin is definitely shallower than the North, which is, so it's not expect, unexpected that it would be warmer. Right. Right. So that, those kinds of changes are dramatic, and, and there's not much we're going to do about that. Right. We are just about out of time. There's a question that I like to ask most guests who have some experience. And we always like to tailor it to their situation. So what advice would you offer to a young Chautauquan who came to you and expressed an interest to become seriously involved in environmental issues? I think being in and about the water is, is the easiest way to grab their attention. Most recently, it, remember, biology is not amongst my my expertise. Mm -hmm. So looking through a microscope was always hard. The magic in a microscope for a body of water like any, any body of water is amazing. Once you understand the smallest of the creatures and what lives there, I'd put a microscope, I'd put a view scope, I'd put goggles and fins on any child and make sure that they look and walk around and pick up and I'm telling you, if they spot a spiny soft shell turtle, they better get excited. There is nothing like it. But under the microscope too, to know what the, what the food web is based on is critical to understanding that piece. We, kinda, we can fall in love easily with a beautiful crystal clear body of water. To understand it, it takes some time. You gotta dig in a little bit. Get somebody to grab that microscope and say, hey, wait a minute, I'll focus it for you, look. Mm -hmm. And we have all those kind of people. Oh, my goodness. And then that love is at a different level. That, that admiration, that connection is at a different level. And now, understanding it, whole nother level, 
protect it next. That's great. I hope the consortium has given that mm, maybe inspiration to a few people because that's our job. You we bet. are trying to protect it. You bet. We are out of time. This has been great fun, oh. and I hope you'll come back sometime soon. I would love to, and thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John.